everybody. I think we are going to start and respect the schedule. So welcome to this uh, next session. Uh, our current speaker is Eduardo Blancas. is uh, the co-founder and CEO of Bloomberg, Bloomberg, a company developing tools to bridge the gap between interactive data work and production, and is going to talk about Beyond Paper Mill, Bloomberg Engine, a new notebook executor for running notebooks in production. Please give a round of applause to Eduardo. Thanks a lot for joining. I hope you are enjoying JupyterCon and Paris. So today we're going to be talking about notebooks in production. And so thanks a lot. Um, I have a little friend here who's also going to help me with the presentation. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll give you some quick background on myself. Um, so I'm a co-founder and CEO of, of Bloomberg. We're a small company developing open source tools for data science and machine learning. Um, we have four or five tools like Bloomberg, Jupyter, SQL, and others. And I'm a former data scientist. So the reason why I started the company is because I wanted to uh, build better tools to analyze data and to uh, bring those analyses from the prototype that you have in your notebook to production, to something that um, helps other people make decisions in a reliable way. OK, so before I start talking about the, the project that I'm going to be describing, um, I want to mention the background and the motivation for building Plumber Engine. So as I mentioned before, uh, we, um, we have a company that helps other uh, companies run notebooks in production. And we encounter Papermill, which is an amazing package. Right? It helps you run notebooks from the command line interface and from Python. So we started, um, when we started the company, we were advising people to use Papermill. And things were great. They were running scheduled notebooks. But at some point, and I can mention some of the use cases, like model retraining and report generation. However, when we started going into deeper stuff, more complex stuff, they started to have issues. Um, so by the way, is, is the sound OK? Can you hear me OK? Yes? Great. OK. Um, so we, we started encountering some issues. And I can give an example. Uh, what about testing notebooks? Right? If we want to generate a report from a notebook, uh, we may want to have some tests to make sure that the notebook works as expected and uh, have some guardrails if this notebook is to be used to make decisions. The second thing is monitoring. Sometimes companies have sh uh, clusters, and they are sharing resources within the team. So it's good to have a measurement of how much memory some notebook is using, and not only for debugging teams, but also for, for monitoring, and especially monitoring uh, things in production. Uh, the other use case, which was the one that started the project, was debugging. Uh, many of the companies that use uh, many of our clients and, and people who use our open source projects uh, run these notebooks on schedule, right? So let's say they generate, they retrain a machine learning model every week, and sometimes bad things happen. And there are many things that can go wrong when you are scheduling a notebook. It might be that the data changed, or might be some um, a version like in a library, and things may break. So the problem is they uh, had this notebook which was half executed, and then they didn't have the tools to debug. Because if you don't have enough logs, or you are not storing all the context somewhere, it's pretty difficult to debug. All you have is some error message, and that's it. So we enable debugging for these notebooks. So I'll go into detail for all of these use cases. And here I have the, the relevant links for the project. So the documentation is at engine.plumber.io. And the code is on GitHub, slash plumber, slash plumber, dash engine. So that's the background. We encountered many issues with the companies that were running notebooks in production, and we wanted to improve um, all these things. So let's take a step back and think why Papermill wasn't the best choice for this. So I'll just briefly mention how Papermill works and why this, um, th this way of, of working didn't allow us to fulfill all these use cases. The first one, and the most important one, is that Papermill runs. And for people who are not familiar with Papermill, it's a command line tool that allows you to run notebooks. And it has uh, a lot of other things, but that's, that's kind of the core. So when you start Papermill and when you run a notebook, it actually starts a second process. And the first process is only sending your code, executing it, and getting back a response. So this process, if you um, monitor this process, it will not consume much memory, just the Python interpreter, and not much CPU. 
What's uh, the actual process that's doing all the heavy lifting is the IPython kernel. It's executing your code, getting the results, and then sending it back to PaperMill so it can rewrite the cells in the notebook, your output notebook. Now, the good thing is that this allows you to support multiple languages because the second process in this case is an IPython kernel, but can be R, Julia, or any other language that you can use with Jupyter. One limitation is that results must be serialized, right? If you want to go back from the kernel to uh, the paper, paper mill process, you have to serialize this so you can transfer to the other process. And the final thing is that it doesn't have built-in support for standard input. So if you are requesting a password, for example, from the notebook, let's say some secret credentials, uh, it won't work. Or if you want to start a debugging session that's interactive, for example, with PDB, it won't work. So we started to think, how can we overcome these challenges so that our users and clients can do all these things? Because these are really important things, because when things go well, you just execute your notebook and that's it. When they go wrong, you can spend hours or days trying to figure out what happened. So that's where we, uh, when we started Plumber Engine. And it has a different architecture. It's pretty simple. It's just a single process that runs a, an IPython shell. And it runs the notebook in the same way that you would do with PaperMill. So this has the advantage that your results don't require serialization, and you can pass any object between these two. You can pass function definitions, class definitions, any variable in your notebook, anything. Anything that resides in your notebook, you can pass it without any serialization back to your Python process where you might be manipulating your notebook. Standard input is also supported, which is really important for debugging. And I'll show an example in a minute. The caveat is that this is Python only. Fortunately for us, this wasn't uh, a big of an issue because most of our users exclusively use Python, like 90, 95% of them. And for the ones who don't, they can still use uh, PaperMill, which is awesome for R and Julia and all the other kernels that, uh, all the other languages that they might be using. And I'll show you uh, a quick example. So it has the same API as PaperMill because we wanted to lo lower the ver barrier to entry. Um, so you just change the import, and it has pretty much all the same arguments, except a few more, which are the new features that we, that we added. So you can use it either in a Python session, because you might be adding some extra Python logic to it, like scheduling, or maybe downloading some data before you run your notebook, or configuring some, something in the session, or you can use it in a CLI. So bo both of them have the same features. Great. OK, so now uh, we'll be doing the fun part, which is the interactive demo. And what I'm about to show you is a notebook that uses SQL. That's another project of, of ours that allows you to run SQL inside the notebook. So we will be running some SQL queries, plotting some data, and then we'll run this with Plumber Engine. OK, so I have this notebook. And I'll quickly go through it. It's, uh, it's pretty long, but basically it's downloading some sample data set. You can see that here. And then it's using DocDB to run SQL queries in the CSV file. Right? So I download the CSV, and then I run some queries. I do some aggregations. I create some plots. And I think I'm downloading a larger data set here. Yes, larger data set, aggregations, and more plots. So pretty typical uh, notebook using SQL. Let's say this is a um, report that you want to generate every Monday at 9 AM. So you run the same thing with different data, and then somebody checks the output and makes that and uses that to make decision, decisions. OK, so how do you use uh, Plumer Engine? So let's say you are finishing this notebook, and you say, OK, this works well. Let's deploy to production. And now you're going to start scheduling this. I can come to my terminal. Uh, I'm going to execute it manually, but you can also use any scheduler that you want. And I do Plumber Engine. And then I pass the path to my input notebook. So intro, and then the path to the output notebook. So the input is my source, and the output is the same thing, so same code with the outputs. Um, and in this case, it's going to be exactly the same, but if it's running with different data, then the results will look different. So now let's say, let's call this intro. I already have this file, so I'll call it output. Let's say output report. And it will start executing your notebook. So that's it. It runs your notebooks. That's the most basic use case. You have a notebook, you execute it. And now we can see output report IPNB. 
right here. And you can see it has the outputs. It, it ran from top to bottom. So that's the most basic use case. Now, let's go into some more, more details and see more interesting use cases. So the first one is uh, interactive debugging. So let's say you have this report and crashes in the middle of execution, and now you want to understand what happened. It's probably going to be really difficult for a real world use case because you may have dozens of variables, different data sets, and different configurations, and many packages, right? So how, how do you do that? If you are just executing this, and you have all your uh, print statements, it, it will help you. But in many cases, you want to inspect what's going on, how, how Python looked like when it crashed. So that, that's what we are going to do right now. So I'll use the debug later IPyNB uh, notebook. So let me run this. Here I'm downloading a sample notebook. Uh, let me show you the source code. So this one is pretty simple. It only has one cell, and it has uh, an x variable equals 1, y equals 0, and then I'm doing x over, uh, x over y. So we know this is going to crash. Um, but in a real use case, we won't know. It won't be so easy to understand what's going on. right? So let's assume this is the notebook that we want to debug. We are scheduling this every morning at 9 AM, and now we run the notebook. Now, uh, See that I'm passing debug later equals true, so I'm enable debugging. So let's execute this notebook. So we see the error here, and well, it's pretty clear in this case, but in probably another case, it's it, it was, it's going to be difficult to just debug the whole thing based on the error message. Fortunately, since I enable debug later, I'll have an extra file, and I'll show that to you here. So I'm showing the files. Um, is the font size OK? OK, great. So I'm checking the files that I have in this folder. So I'm doing ls. And you see this output.dump. This is the file that we are going to use to start the debugging session. So let me, let me open a terminal. So imagine this is running on some EC2 machine. It broke. Now you have this. You upload that to S3. And now you can start the debugging session. So I come here to my terminal, and I don't have to. I don't even have to use the same machine. As long as it has the same packages and it's running the same operating system, it will work. So I have my output.dump, and I do DLTR. This stands for debug later, and I do output.dump, and it starts the debugger right here. So remember. Uh, our original file, which was um, let me let me go back to yeah here. So we have two variables, right? X, Y, and I can come here and print X and Y, and I can do all kind of operations. These are pretty simple. These are numbers. I cannot do much with them, but I can I can run any any code that I want. Right, and this is pretty useful because I, for example, imagine if this is a data frame and it broke in some processing step. I may want to look at certain rows. Maybe it's breaking because it has some NAs or because some values are out of range, and I will only be able to know that if I explore the, the data. And this is re recovering the state, so it will allow me to do that um, easily. So that's one of the most important use cases. I'll, I'll show you a few more. The other one is memory profiling. So what happens if we are running a notebook and we want to know how much memory it's consuming? This is important, uh, especially now that all companies use cloud infrastructure, because we encounter many cases where our clients were using big machines like 128 gigabytes of RAM, and they were only using 32 or 64, because it's really difficult to optimize for this. And it's especially difficult because notebooks change, and they can go, they can start using a lot more resources or a lot fewer resources. So how do you keep track of these things? You can use Plumber Engine to profile these notebooks and not only understand what's the maximum amount of RAM that they are using, but also where they are using it. And this may help you also to optimize these, um, these notebooks. So let me quickly show you how that looks like. OK, so this is the sample notebook. I am generating uh, a notebook uh, with code. So what we'll, what this cell does is it creates a new IPynB file. And as you can see, I am importing NumPy and the time package. And then I'm creating an array with some numbers and then another array that has even more numbers. So pretty simple. That, that's all I'm doing. 
So let me generate my notebook. And now I do the same thing that I did earlier, except I pass profile memory equals true. And let's run this. Oh, I need, I miss uh, an import here. Okay. Great. Now we have memory usage. And we can see what happened, right? In the first two cells, I didn't do much. I, it was an import, and but let's actually see what I did. Yeah, so I, had, I was importing and then just calling sleep, so not doing anything for 0.5 seconds. So that's why we only see, we don't see any bumps. It's just the memory that the Python session is taking. And then we see a little bump on cell three. And this is because I'm allocating some uh, memory for the first array. And then we go to sleep again. That's why we don't see anything here. And then I'm allocating a huge array. And that's why we see this, well, not so big. Um, but relative to the rest of the notebook, we, we can see this peak. And then it goes to sleep again. So this is how you can profile your notebooks and find um, the bottlenecks or any, any performance issues that you may have. We are adding some extra features here, for example, labeling the sales so you can clearly see what you're doing, because right now you can only see the sale index. OK. Uh, and some extra thing, you can customize the plot. So this is a regular matplotlib plot. So if you want to make it fancier, you can um, always uh, change uh, whatever you want, right? I'm just adding a different title. You can change the colors. Um, the final thing is that you can also save the profiling data. This was actually a community contribution. So we, we love community contributions. And this was someone who was uh, running some uh, astrophysics simulations. And uh, they wanted to profile memory. And they wanted to analyze the, 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 the measurements. So we now have an option that's uh, save profiling data equals true. And this will save your profiling data CSV file. So you can see that here, right? Cell, the cell index, the runtime, and the memory. OK. Um, let's go to testing. That's really important, right? Because if you are encountering issues with your notebooks and you want to optimize them, um, one important thing is that you don't let the same things happen again. So you can add tests, and you can prevent those things from happening, and you can detect those things earlier. So I'll mention how you can use Plumber Engine for doing two things. The first one is unit testing. And by unit testing, I mean I have a function or a class definition in my notebook. And I want to run some um, test cases, some input, and then check the output. And the second use case is integration testing. This is slightly different. In integration testing, I run my notebook, and then I check the outputs. Uh, might be one data frame, might be some specific variable. I want to check what was the output when the cell executed. So let's go with unit testing first. Uh, okay, so unit testing. Let me start running my notebook. Um, I am downloading a sample notebook. And what I'm doing here is I am passing, I am using the Python API in Plumber Engine, and I'm saying Plumber client from path. So this takes an argument, and this is the path of the notebook that I want to unit test. And then I do client.getDefinitions. And this will give me all the definitions that reside in the notebook. So these will be functions or classes. So let me run this. And it returns a dictionary. And this dictionary has the, the keys, which is the name of the function or the class, and then the object. So this is uh, where we can see the benefit of, of the Plumber Engine architecture that doesn't need to serialize anything. The notebook has some function definition in Python, and I can just get that object as is. Um, and then I can use this uh, dictionary to extract the function definitions. So this notebook has two functions, one that uh, adds two numbers, and the other one multiplies two numbers. So I can do definitions and then get the add function, and definitions and get the multiply function. And then I can run unit tests on this. I can check the implementation of my add function by passing 1 and 41 and 50, 50. And we, we see that no errors happen. And we can do the same for the multiply um, function. And I can, I'm showing this in a notebook because this is the easiest way for me to show you how it looks like. But you can also use this in PyTest, right? You can um, run the same code in a PyTest uh, fixture. And then you can start adding this. This is actually how we do it internally in our code base, how we test the function definitions using PyTest. But you can also do it inside another notebook. It depends on uh, how you like it more. Great. So now I move into integration testing. So remember, unit testing was about 
statically getting definitions from my notebook, loading them, and then running inputs, the inputs, my, my input test cases. Now, integration testing is slightly different because I'll take the notebook, I'll execute it, and then I'll inspect what happened in the notebook. So same idea, I am um, downloading some sample notebook, and the first line looks the same. So I'm initializing the Plumber client with from path, and then I'm passing the path to the notebook. And now I'm uh, calling a different function. Uh, it, the other one was get definitions. This is get namespace. What get namespace does is it will run the notebook, and then it will capture all the variables and their values. So let's see. Now you see that I get the same things that I did before. So add and multiply the function definitions, but I get two new things. I get the variables. So let's actually check how this testing demo looks like. So you see, I, I have two function definitions, and then I'm executing those functions with certain values. So in the first one, we expect that the output should be 42, and the second one should be 200. Right, so let's go back. And then I can check those variables. And I can check that namespace A is 42, and namespace B is 200. So you can use this. Uh, one, one common use case for this is if you are orchestrating multiple notebooks. Let's say you have a notebook that loads some data, and the second notebook is cleaning the data. You may want to check right after loading the data that the data looks fine before you go and clean the data. because in production, you may encounter issues and you may encounter problems with your uh, clean notebook, but you don't. You may not know if it's because the cleaning notebook is has some issues or because the input data is wrong. So it's usually these are guardrails that allow you to find at which stage are, uh, things are going wrong. And and most uh, users uh, use this feature for testing the output data. Make sure that they it has in certain properties like. Uh, the column in a table has a certain type, or the values are within certain range, and if not, then they raise uh, an, an exception so they know that something's going going wrong. Okay. Um, now, pipeline orchestration. So, the we started Plumber Engine as a small feature within Plumber. And then it became its own project because many people like to use it independently. But what's Plumber? So Plumber is another project um, that allows you to run multi-step pipelines. And why would you want to run many notebooks in, in like an orchestrated way? Uh, it's usually two use cases. The first one is you have a large, large team and different people are responsible for different data sets or different parts of the analysis. So you want to break it down into small pieces so they can modify it at the same time. Um, otherwise, if everyone's working on the same notebook, things may get a um, little difficult to manage. So this allows you to follow software engineering best practices and break down into multiple small parts. That's the first case. The second one is when you want to run things at the same time. And for example, here I have a pipeline, a pretty simple machine learning pipeline that loads two data sets, then it cleans the data set. So loading, cleaning, and here it's the second data set, loading, cleaning, generate some features and train the model. One extension of this pipeline could be, I want to train 100 models at the same time, right? So then I can create a notebook, like a template. I can parameterize it and then run the same different models with different parameters and run it at the same time. So that's why breaking down into smaller pieces allows you to uh, do these things. And now we embedded Plumber Engine into Plumber, and it's the, the piece that executes the notebooks where Plumber allows you to coordinate the execution. So you can also check out the project. The GitHub URL is here. So github.com slash Plumber slash Plumber. Um, so that was it on my side. I am sharing my GitHub, uh, the company's GitHub profile here. Uh, if you have, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll still have some time for questions right now, but in case uh, you want to ask me any other thing, um, feel free to reach out to me. So here's my, my email, uh, my Twitter, and my LinkedIn. Uh, so I'm always excited to talk to practitioners, especially because those, uh, when we talk to our users and, and practitioners, we learn many things, and, and it helps us uh, prioritize what's the most important thing that we should build. Because as a small company, we want to build something that excites people and that's useful for people. Uh, so thank you very much. We can start with the questions.
Thanks a lot, Eduardo. Great talk. Um, anyone has some question for this work? Yeah. Hi, thank you for the, the excellent, really interesting talk. Um, the, uh, the notebook that is executed by Bloomberg, I was just wondering what languages or what language kernels are supported there. Is it, is it Python or? Yeah, so since we uh, are executing everything in the same process, it only supports Python. Uh, if you want to use other languages, you can use Papermill. For your um, testing example, had you considered having the asserts in the notebook and then executing them using Plumber Engine as, instead of having it sort of outside of the notebook? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I think we, we, we were considering, I think both approaches are feasible. I think right now it was mostly because how we do uh, things internally, that we use PyTest, that our examples go with this route of separating things. Um, certainly what you mentioned is probably what makes most sense in the data science context, but I think we haven't figured out the, the API, the right API. Uh, should, should the notebooks be in the same, like should, should they be visible in the same cell, different cells? Um, so I think we're still experimenting with it, um, but I agree. I think there's, a, there's an opportunity there to kind of have both things in the same place, uh, but it's quite challenging to have something that works without getting into the way of how you are used to do things, right? Um, but yeah, I, th I think um, we, we can chat later. I think I, I would like to hear what you think. Thanks. Still time for questions? So the debugging demo was really cool. Uh, you know, you get the dump and then load it up. I'm just wondering, is it possible to do the debugging session in the notebook itself? So it's, the notebook has failed, you go back and open that notebook and essentially just run it where it was. Yes, yes, you can. Um, there, are, there are different ways of how you can do it. The first one is you can keep the process on when it crashes, and then you can open that notebook and then start debugging. So I think that's, that's probably the best user experience, in my opinion. We haven't implemented it in the open source, but you have the right tools in the package to do it. So I think that that makes sense. Um, right now, we implement it this way because usually uh, what happens is the notebook crashes when it's uh, scheduled. So running at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., um, nobody wants to debug things at that hour, right? So you save it for l later, and then you can debug it. Hi, uh, for your, sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the talk. The testing examples, do you have any examples or suggestions where the functions are more complicated, like calling other services or dependencies and things like that? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I would say that I would follow software engineering best practices. I wouldn't say that because you are testing a notebook, the concepts should be different, so probably in the most simple use case, you want to test your definitions and mock external services. That can be your unit test that can run independently of, of anything. Now, if you want to have a testing suit that um, reflects accurately or more accurately your environment, then yes, I think it kind of makes sense to run some tests with actual services. But it depends on, um, on your project and other things. So I think following software engineering best practices in, in general makes sense. All right, thanks a lot, Eduardo. Let's mm -hmm. give uh, Eduardo another round of applause, please. Thank you.